Welcome to History 134. The Franks and the Vikings. We're on Part 3, which is the Vikings. And as you can see, we're going to look at helmets. We're going to look at warriors. We're going to see raiding. We're going to look at the ships. We'll have mythology and a whole variety of other things. So let's get started. Welcome to History 134. I'm Professor Packett. Uh, we are on the third section of our first week of class, which is the Vikings. And as you can see, got my Frankish outfit on, but the Vikings wore this as well. And I have the most famous of the non-hats worn by people in history. The Vikings did not wear horny hats. Uh, technically, it's done in the 1800s for some theatrical performances, but you do have references of the various uh, priests and monastery areas that have been robbed, saying that, oh, they were the devil and they were horned people and what have you. Later on in this unit on the Vikings, I will show you what they actually wore. But I wanted to start off like that. The other thing is, my little friend here, Hagar, Hagar the Horrible, it's a comic strip with Vikings. And although he has the horny hat on, he has on something else. He has on a, a bearskin overgarment, which is called a berserk. Uh, it's sometimes made out of wolf skin and it's sometimes made out of bear skin. And the belief was that if you wore that skin of the animal that you had killed, when you went in the battle, you could become that animal, which is where the term berserker comes from. It is not an item that you could purchase and wear. You had to kill the animal yourself. Now, Hagar has always been kind of special when my daughters were very little they noticed that mommy and daddy did not have anything to hug while they were in bed at night. And they had dolls, so they thought that was terrible. So they got me Hagar, so I would have something to, to hang on to. But uh, let me uh, change my clothes and we'll look at the real historical helmets of the Vikings. Invasion, 700 to 1,000, the Second Dark Ages. The first one, of course, is the barbarian invasion from Asia, although there is part of it here, as well as the volcanic eruption that came out of Iceland. At any rate, you see on this map, which is the one we looked at at the end of the Carolingian dynasty, the Viking invasions. They will settle in, in parts of England and in Ireland and in Normandy, and they will do some other settling up in the Russian area. We, of course, have invasions from various Muslim caliphates, although they're hardly barbarians. And then we have another round of Asian barbarians, which are the Magyars, which here it shows them in that central region of the Carpathian Mountains moving out, but they actually come in from Asia. The Norse homeland. Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. We've all seen pictures of the fjords and the beautiful terrain that you find in Norway, and you find it in Sweden as well. Of course, Denmark is a whole series of islands. And you have the expansion outward from this area. And of course, the Danes are unified. Uh, the Swedes, to some extent, are unified as well. And the Swedes tend to be uh, raiding more along the uh, Polish-Lithuanian Rus area. But the Norwegian Norse are the ones that tend to be moving over towards England and Iceland and Scotland, as well as the, some of the Danes as well. And one version as to why that may have happened at this particular time is that what we call Norway was made up of a variety of kings. There are some people that claim that more than 30 people claim to be the king of Norway, and ultimately they are unified by one man. And in the process of doing that, the losers had the choice of either becoming, you know, the vassals of the new king or leave. And and many of them chose to leave rather than do what the, the new king wanted them to do. And a lot of them maneuvered around. So there's a lot of that. And they do trading as well. It's not to assume that they're all just looting, pillaging, and burning. And then here we have an Iron Age fort. You can see the outline of the long buildings. Now you would have had people owning property. This is in Denmark. These would have been areas where the little towns or villages were located, where you could have defensive positions and you were under attack. Here we have an example of a longhouse that is actually found in Lanzo Meadows in northern Newfoundland.
Newfoundland. But there are a variety of these that survive all over the region. And this is a breakdown of what a long building would look like. You'd have a family or multiple families living in these. A fire in the middle, which would go up through the roofs. And then you have the rest of the places where you would sleep, store things. Here's a, what it would look like on the inside. With These are a group of reenactors from Lanso Meadows. Now, there is a, a Muslim traveler, Ibn Battuta. And when he saw this uh, and, and heard their singing and ate their food, he said he understood why the Vikings were not afraid to die, that their food and their screaming was so horrible. Initially, all of the Norse sources were, of course, oral tradition, the Eddas and sagas that would be told over fires and at meetings and all sorts of other things. But ultimately, they are written down. You have the rune stones. Sometimes those are magical symbols. Sometimes they're actually writing. Today, we every one of us has on our phone a Viking glyph. It's the glyph of Harold Bluetooth, Gomishan, who was the Danish king who lived around 950 CE. He united the various Danish tribes and is believed to have been the first Viking king to convert to Christianity. His nickname was suggested for the present-day Bluetooth wireless standard by James Kardash, who at the time of his involvement in a related program was reading Franz Bettensen's book, The Long Ship. So we get two runes come together to make Bluetooth. And then here's a couple of the most important of the works, King Harold's Saga, which is the story of Harold Hadrada, and the Vinland Sagas, which are the Norse discovery of America. Now, every Danish king or every king in the Scandinavian countries had their own court historian, but nothing was allowed to be put into that chronicle unless it had been verified by two other sources. And then here is a picture of the Eric the Red Saga, a actual surviving page, the hole in it, by the way, is a result of uh, worms eating into it. And there are a lot of other wonderful books and sources. The Vikings that I put up here by Bronsted is excellent. The God's Myths in Northern Europe is a great part on the mythologies. So there's a lot of sources. You can find a lot of them online as well. The Vikings have always been a good source for movie material. And the Vikings that I like is the one with Kirk Douglas and uh, Tony Curtis. It has the king's burial. It has great battle scenes. It has all sorts of, of aspects of Viking life. Then you see the 13th warrior with Antonio Banderas. And that's supposed to be based on a little bit of Ibn Battuta's travels. But it goes way off the, the deep end. And of course, the miniseries that's been running on television, The Vikings, are just awesome. Although Largatha is probably a little bigger than she really would have been in the in ancient times. They do have shield maidens, but not to the extent that she is depicted. They had the all thing in there. They had all sorts of the fighting equipment, the customs. It was wonderful. Now, then we have the Viking queen that you see here. And this one, you have to be careful. That is not a Viking queen. That is Boudicca. That's a movie that was done on the uh, English Celts revolting against the Romans. And then the long ships, which has the old the actor that played the six million dollar man that one actually goes and attacks areas of north africa that's not very good either so you have to kind of pick and choose your viking movie the comic book creators also liked Vikings. Thor has been a comic book hero for a long period of time. And then they did some spin-offs. There's one on Baldar, the, the God of Good. And then there's the little Hagar the Horrible cartoon book, which is which is really funny. They have all sorts of different aspects of, of Viking life in there. There's one where all the group is at this Viking funeral. And one gentleman turns to the other and says, you know... It's a shame we don't get together more often. So the comic book people are also helping us out on studying the Vikings. Well, I'm back, and this time, obviously, I don't have the horny hat on. But a lot of you may not be familiar with this style of helmet. It's actually a Vandal's helmet from the invaders that came in. But it is adopted by a lot of the barbarian groups, and some of the elite Viking warriors wore this hat as well. This helmet is the helmet of the Varangian Guard, the Norse bodyguards of the Byzantine Empire. So it's, it's quite appropriate. But as you can see, the full beard all the way around, this thing rusts, and it's really hard to uh, maintain it like this. So I will get into something a little bit more familiar to you. This is what most of the time that you will see. Some people will call this a Norman helmet. has a nasal here, which is supposed to make you feel better about blocking an axe or an air or a, 
or a sword, but it's not going to help you much. But almost everyone can wear this. And you'll find that used throughout the Middle Ages, even into the Hundred Years War period. Relatively reasonable and easy to maintain. But if you're a chieftain, this doesn't really work that well. So for a chieftain, we need to kind of split the difference between the two. So you end up with what is known as a grimashaw. Well, I'm not probably pronouncing it as well because my Swedish and Norwegian is terrible. Even though my oldest descendants come from Norway about 800. So here we have a, a Viking nobleman's helmet. Great vision. These ocular openings provide great protection, but they provide great vision. Easy to speak. You've got the chain mail to protect the back of your neck. And you've got the little point, basically to let everybody know you're a little bit better than everyone else. And it's pretty comfortable to wear. Now I'm in chain mail. Not all Vikings wore chain mail. The upper classes, the nobles would later on. Uh, most people would be wearing leather or the berserks. And if you had the chain mail on, you would have other garments on underneath it. Now in front of me, I have two of the main weapons the Vikings use. Of course, they use spears, they use daggers. We always talk about the Viking axe. They come in different sizes. This is a throwing axe. You can use it with, with your hands. They come in shorter sizes. There's a really long one that's about six feet in length with a much bigger head. And they frequently use that when you're combating um, shield walls or when you're fighting on the sea. Because with this point that you have here, you don't really need to if you hit somebody, that's fine. But if you throw it over behind them and then pull it towards you, you see it grabs the person and then that allows you to pull them out of their defensive formation so that you can deal with them a little bit more. And they may carry several of these. They also carry bigger axes, double-headed axes, you name it. The other thing is the swords. Everybody has a sword. The Viking swords are usually... Very special, fancy ones, handed down from generation to generation. Um, and I want you to notice something on this. On the hill, on the hilt here, there's a what looks like a button. And then you have the leather. Now the leather is called a fridbond. And obviously everywhere you go, you carry your sword. And if you're at a party and you're drinking mead, honey wine, or too much beer, the last thing you want is to get into an argument, grab your sword and pull it out. If you pull your sword out, it has to be used. It has to draw blood. So one of the fail safes, the safety devices on this, is you tie this in the leather. When you get ready to pull it out, it's difficult to do. And hopefully that will allow Sven's friends to get to him and say, don't do that. But if you needed to use it, you would just simply untie it. You're getting ready to go into combat, for example. You obviously would have it untied previously. And it will just allow you to. Utilize your sword. And we have a lot of, a lot of originals that survive. And you'll see some of them in the presentation as we go along. And some of them have Damascan steel in them. They have special markings on them. There's one or two blacksmiths that made them, and they have a, an unusual factor in that you could take it and bend it about four inches and flex it back. And they're very sought after. There are only about, I think, 20 of them that have been authenticated. We do know that Viking smiths faked it. They would take some of their swords and then cut in places along here and then insert metal with the name that would normally be associated with that sword. But you'll see all sorts of these. And these usually are, with, with most people, sometimes they are handed from generation to generation. Other times they go with you to the grave 
or to the boat because you may need that in Valhalla. So let's continue on with the presentation. Here's a list of various Viking weapons and or defensive devices. Conical shaped helmets, and as I've said before, no horns. A leather shirt. It can be a animal skin shirt, but that would be a berserk, a bear skin or a wolf skin. And only the people remember who killed those animals could wear them. They had a variety of swords, but they are very, very, very precious to each individual. They had spears, they had throwing spears. They had lances. They have axe. They have a throwing axe. They have handheld battle axes. And they use a rounded shield with a little boss in the middle of it. So the shield not only is for protection, but it can be used for offensive purposes as well. The Vikings have a variety of helmets. Just make sure they don't have a horn on them. Here we have something that looks very much like an Anglo-Saxon helmet, like the Sutton Ho helmet. It's leather with some metal pieces, cheek pieces. You have chain mail on the back of it. Very lightweight, very easy to put on magnificent vision and then you have this incredible monstrous helmet this thing has the metals all metal with it with the gigantic chainmail beard and the chainmail beard of course now has rusted completely solid now that's about seven pounds worth of helmet that's not a starter helmet for anybody and although it looks like it wouldn't have much vision it's still has pretty good vision. You see the problem with chain mail is that it, it rusts and the only way you can keep chain mail from rusting is constantly cleaning it and if it does rust you need to put it into a container that has river stone and roll that container up and down until you crack off the rust and people say well what happened to all the chain mail where'd it go? Well it ends up being pot scrubbers. They cut it up in the sections and make pot scrubbers out of it but there is an infinite variety of helmets that you would find the Vikings wear. Here is a display of Viking weapons in the Museum de l'Army in the Envalide in Paris. These were left over from the attack on the Ile de la Cité by Rollo and his Vikings, who later on became the Dukes of Normandy. And you see the axes there, very similar to the one that I showed you on my desk. You have some of the shorter swords, you've got spear points, and you've got the little boss up there that would have been in the center of one of the wooden shields. And here we have a little different shot. Here's the little pile of rusted chain mail with a rusted conical shaped helmet and then you have one of these special swords you can see the engraving just above the hilt and these swords the ones that are authentic there are 20 or more that have been found they have incredible tinsel strength, and it's believed that they received some metal that the Vikings traded all over, and they traded with in the Middle East. And so it, probably somebody got a couple of pounds of this Damascene steel and then was able to mix it in here and put his name on it on the blade. And you'll see these in, in a variety of museums. Not a lot of Most of the originals are in Denmark. But there is a traveling exhibition that I saw in 2019 that had one of them. Here's some of the the other types of swords that you'll see. Now, the handles are usually wrapped with leather. The, any any weakness in a sword is basically in what is called the tang, and that is the narrow piece where the wide sword then tapers down and becomes the handle. If that's too too narrow, that'll break. Here's another example of, of the swords. This one has a closer view. Here is one of those that has been marked, and I believe this one is one of the fakes. Some of the blacksmiths were faking this so they could sell them for more money. But, you know, the downside of an iron sword is it does rust. Here we have one that has silver inset on the handle and the uh, hand guard. So Viking swords are, are stunning. And if you get a chance to see a Viking touring exhibition, they almost always have a large number of these. At the, at the one that I was talking about in 2019 when we were in Denver, they had one that they had it on display, but they had it in a case that you could pick it up and feel its weight. It's not really all that heavy. It's the speed of the slash and not necessarily the weight of the blade. Well, now we get to Norse mythology. And I think that other than Greek mythology, people are probably more familiar with Norse mythology than any other culture. So let's look at it in a couple of different sections. Let's look at the cosmology. Cosmology means creation. What does their universe look like? And the Vikings believed that you had a land of coldness in the north and a land of fire in the south. And in the middle was this land of emptiness. And that's where creation takes place, in between the real cold and the real heat. 
The Norse worlds. Here's two artistic renderings of what the Norse viewed the worlds. You see the Yggdrasil tree, the world tree in the middle. You have the heat and you have the cold and you have the different areas. And then the other, again, you have the tree of life. And look at its roots. There's one root that goes down into the spring of Helgamir and one of the spring of Mir and one of the well of Erd. And of course, this is why Odin only has one eye. He gave one eye up to be able to to see what was going on in all of the worlds at the same time. And you see Bifrost, that's the rainbow bridge between Asgard and Midgard, where we are located. And then here's another different view. There's the Yggdrasil tree, the universal tree. You have Asgard, Midgard, and Niflheim, which is the land of the dead, which is ruled by Hel, or Hela, as sometimes she's referred to. Midgard, the world of man. Asgard, the Aesir, the gods, the Varnir, Varnaheim, the elves, Alfheim, and then we've got the fire giants at Muswellheim down below. Well, let's look at the realms of Asgard, of which there are 12. We're just going to look at three. Valhalla, the one you're pretty much familiar with. The Hall of the Slain. 540 doors. Rafters are made out of spears. The roof is made out of shields and body armor. A wolf and an eagle guard the west door. 800 warriors can exist side by side at each door. So this is the Hall of the, of the Slain. This is where all the Viking warriors want to go. Brought there by Odin's daughters, the Valkyries. Then we have Valksva, the Hall of Odin. And Gimli, the Hall of Gold, the Hall of Righteousness. You just don't have to be a killer in order to get in the Asgard. You can get into your own variation by being just a scientist or a literary person or just a, a righteous person. So there's something there for everybody. Well, let's look at the Aesir, which are the 12 gods of Asgard. For those of you who are in my History 134 class, you're only really going to be responsible for Odin, Thor, Loki, and Hemdal, just so you don't go crazy trying to write everything down. Look at the genealogical chart, and I found this online with the nice Viking longship with the genealogy. So you have Ymir, the giants, and then you have Loki comes out of that, and Bestia, and then we have Loki and Argoboda, and they provide us with Hel, the wolf, and the Midgard serpent, Mythgarth Sorum. And then you have Bestia, and there she marries Bor, and there's where Odin comes from. And then we have Odin's children, Frigg, Earth, Grind, there's Thor, there's Baldar, Hoder, all the other gods, and how they all connect with one another. So that's the background of where they came from. It's a little, it's a little easier than the Greek gods. Well, let's look at each of the individual gods. And I've tried to choose a picture that was more appropriate to the Norse tradition instead of picking something that was going to show them in a more modern, bulked up look. But sometimes I couldn't resist. So I tried to get them out of old uh, Eddas and sagas. And we'll see what we do. So here's Odin, father, leader of the gods. Picture up above is a wanderer, which is how he's depicted very, very frequently. And then, of course, we have his powerful look there on the throne. Uh, has one eye, lost the other earning the right to drink from the well of wisdom god of war god of death poetry wisdom eats no food drinks only wine frigg is his wife he has a never miss spear called ganunger and schlepmer is his eight-footed horse now there's an interesting story with with schlepmer on the 21st day of december which is the longest day of the year it was customary for children to leave food outside of their home for schlepmer because the belief was that odin would come around and check on everybody because they is a big deal because if you had enough food at this point, you could tell you could make it to the spring. So if you left, the idea was if you left something out for Schlepmer and he ate it, then there would be a reward for you, some sort of a treat, some cookies or something in your boot. And so that was kind of a little, little Christmas thing, although there was no Christmas at that time. Now we get to Thor, everybody's favorite. The son of Odin by the earth goddess Jord. Sif is his wife, the fertility goddess. His red beard has a chariot and is drawn by two goats, Gap Tooth and Tooth Grinder. One assumes they're pretty good sized goats. And he possesses three great treasures. His hammer, Yomer, his belt of power, Mejin's yard. Now that was given to him by his mother. In case he needed more power during a fight, he could tap it and it would increase his power. Your god, that seems kind of strange. I mean, does it cube you as a god? And then he has iron gloves, and that's so he catches Yomer when it flies back to him. So we have those, and we see those for the most part in representations in the Avengers and in comic books. He is the protector of man and god 
against evil. And Thursday is named after him. It's originally Thor's Day. And we'll talk about days of the week as we move along. As a matter of fact, I try to teach the Viking section on a Thursday. It was very common for people to take oaths. You know, I swear by the power of Thor that if I'm lying, let Thor's hammer sound my death knell, which is thunder. It's not something you should really be doing in the Scandinavian Peninsula because there is lots of thunder that takes place in lightning. So you want to be a little careful about making your oaths, if you will. Now here's two examples of what you would, you would find for jewelry with uh, Thor. There's the uh, mold for making various forms of his hammer. And you see the two common ones to the right and the other one was, oh, it looks like a cross. Actually, that's supposed to represent Thor's hammer in action. And he's swinging it and they hit it in all four corners. This is a better view of how you would normally see Thor's hammer in, in action. And sometimes this is mistaken for a swastika. It is not a symbol of Indo-Aryan fire. It is the example of Thor's hammer being swung around. And it's a symbol of good luck. It is actually not uncommon if you find the first Christian churches in the um, Scandinavian area. That tendency is to have some of these little Thor emblems on them for good luck and protection. Aldar. Consider the white-skinned, fairest of all the gods. He's the god of wisdom, and he's merciful, and it's his death that sets off the mechanism for the death of the gods, Ragnarok. And I'll talk about that when we get a little bit further along. Jord, the Norse god of the winds, sea, and fire. He brings good fortune at sea and in the hunt. He is married to the giantess Skadai. His children are Freya and Freyr, whom he fathered on his own sister. Originally, Jord was one of the Vernir, but when they made peace with the Aesir, he and his children were given to them as hostages. The Aesir opponent appointed both Njord and Friar as high priests to preside over sacrifices. Freya was consecrated as the sacrificial priestess. Our next member of the Aesir is kind of a transformation god, Tyre, original Germanic god of war and the patron god of justice and the precursor of Odin. But at the time of the Vikings, Tyre had to make way for Odin, who became the god of war himself. Tyre was by then regarded as Odin's son, or possibly the son of the giant Hymir. He is the boldest of the gods who inspires courage and heroism in battle. Tyre is represented as a man with one hand because his right right hand was bitten off by the gigantic wolf Fernir. In the Old Norse, the wrist was called the wolf joint. His attribute is a spear, the symbol of justice, as well as his weapon. Bragai, the god of eloquence and poetry, and the patron of the skalds, or the poets. In Norse mythology, he is regarded as a son of Odin and Frigg. Ruins were carved on his tongue, and he inspired poetry in humans by letting them drink from the mead of poetry. Bragai is married to Idun, the goddess of eternal youth. Oaths were sworn over the Bragafull, the cup of Bragai, and drinks were taken from it in honor of a dead king. Before a king is ascended the throne, he drank from such a cup. Now here we get back to a god we're familiar with. Himdal, guardian of Bifrost, the rainbow bridge between Asgard and Midgard, and his great possession, the Yallerhorn, whose blast can be heard in every world. His job is to look for the giants coming to fight the Battle of Ragnarok. Loki. As you can see, he's gotten quite an upgrade with his new movie appearances in the Thor movies from the old representations of him from the Eddas and Sagas. He's a little bit on the Hollywood style. At any rate, he's the son of Farbadi and Lofi. He is the enemy of the Aesir. He's a shapeshifter. He can change, do whatever he wants to. God of fire, magic. His mistress, Argaboda, bore him three children, three monsters. Fairnair, the giant wolf, Hel or Hela, the ruler of the dead, who is sometimes depicted as on the front side beautiful on the back side a rotted corpse. And then there's Mythgarth Sorum, the giant world serpent with the venom. His wife, Sijin, stays loyal to him no matter what. And there's a lot of what. Next we have Ul, and Ul is the god of archery. And then there's Forseti, who is the lawgiver and the son of Baldar. 
Now we come to a strange moment in the Aesir. Hoder, the blind god. And a picture here shows him with a, a bow and arrow, which is not something you really want to give a blind person. And I would also say, you have to be careful, this is not hold the door from the uh, from the Game of Thrones. It's just Hoder. Now, he comes in the play, however, in the Ragnarok. And you could say that he anticipates it or starts it. This is an old Norse drawing of what he did. He kills Baldar. And here's what happened. Baldar began having dreams that he was going to die, and it bothered him. This upset the other gods because he's usually very outgoing and fun. And so they decided, well, we'll we'll make sure that can't happen. So they went around through creation and asked everything animate and inanimate to swear it would not hurt Baldar. Well, after that was taken care of and they told him that, he then began to have little fun events by having people try to kill him. They throw rocks at him and do all sorts of things, but nothing could touch him. But Loki found out, good old Loki, that the gods had forgot to talk to the mistletoe. So the mistletoe had not actually taken the oath. So changed himself into a old hag, approached Hoder and said, Hoder, I, I, I have something I want to throw at Baldar, but I'm too weak. And he said, well, I am blind. And he said, well, I can see for you if you will throw my my object here, my throw my spear or shoot my arrow, which of course was made out of a mistletoe. So wham, he throws it, kills Baldar. And everybody then goes after Hoder and he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I was given this by this old woman that they realized that he'd been, you know, tricked. In the end, they found out that the old woman was Loki, so he is punished. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But they didn't bring Baldar back, so that's the way it goes. Actually, there was an attempt to bring him back, but goddess of hell, Hela, the underworld, said that everything would have to cry for him, both animate and inanimate. They did that, again, went back through all of it. But one old woman would not cry. Well, that turned out to be Loki, so that gets him in the trouble again. Now we have the god Honer, and Honer is the companion of Loki and Odin. So I assume he is the god of companionship. The Ragnarok, or Götterdämmerung in German, the beginning of the end of the cosmos. It starts with the incident with Hoder, with the death of Baldar. And then it continues through three, three winters without a summer. Then there is fighting, feuding that will go on in Midgard. And then the sun and the moon will be eaten by Fernir and Hati. The giants will then rise. The dead will rise. And at this point, the march on Asgard begins and Hemdal sounds his horn. Here we see the scene that I showed you before where Hoder shoots the mistletoe and kills Baldar. Okay? Well, then we have the punishment. Underneath it is the punishment of Loki. He's chained to a rock, and this poisonous snake then drips acid like venom on his face, and there's Sif trying to hold a container to catch the, the venom. Well, the snake then kind of holds back, and here's a later, more modern painting of the same event. And as the container gets full, she eventually has to, has to empty it. And when she does, and she walks away from him, then it spits out this huge quantity of venom, causing him to scream. But ultimately, Loki will then break loose and then bring in all of the other creatures. It's the death of the gods, if you will. Now the battle begins. And of course, all the people who were there in Valhalla, they come out to fight. They've been practicing ever since they've arrived. Every morning, the warriors of Valhalla would get up at sunrise and begin fighting and killing each other until sunset. And then at the end of the day, all their body parts would come back together. They would feast, drink, and enjoy the women and do it over again so they would keep in good practice. Well, now everybody's around. So Odin then gets killed by the giant wolf. Fernir. And then Fernir is killed by Vidar. Mythgarth Sorum, the giant world snake, is killed by Thor, but Thor doesn't get out of its way. It explodes with this huge amount of poison that gets Thor. Friar is killed by Surt, who is mortally wounded. Garm fights Tyre, and both of them die. Loki is killed by Hemdal, and they both die. And then Surt, who is mortally wounded and dying, then flings fire over the entire world and destroys everything but the Yggdrasil tree, the world tree. 
century. And it's not the death of the gods, it's the death of this group, because then there's new creation. The uh, drizzle tree opens, and two new, a new man and a new woman, leaf and leaf lacer, come out, and they begin to repopulate the world. Now, here's two artistic views of this final battle. Here you see the giant wolf. Now, you see Thor going after Mythgarth Sorum. You see the fire in the sky, the fighting. There's Loki down below. And then another version where, again, everybody is going after one another with the giant world tree in the background and its huge size. So you end up with the death of the gods. That's what this whole thing is about. Now, there's two interesting points about about this. One is, this doesn't really show up very frequently in Viking uh, sagas until you get closer to the time period of Christianity. So it may be that you start hearing about the death of the gods as the transition begins from the old gods to the new gods. The other is the rock runestone of Sweden. Inside this little roofed structure is what is known as the Rook Stone. In the language of the Vikings, in Old Norse, Rock, R-O-K, meant monolith. There is no other rune stone that is as big as the Swedish rock. It weighs five tons, it is eight feet tall, and its five sides are covered with the longest runic inscription in existence, some 760 runes divided into 28 lines. And while the vast majority of the rune stones date to after the mid 10th century AD. The original inscriptions at the bottom of the rook are around 800 AD or before. Now here's a little better shot of the runic markings on it. Now the beginning of this inscription, scholars agree it's it describes a man named Bamoth as death doomed. Now most rune stones memorialize the dead. The phrase is unique to this rock and it suggests that the young man was fated for this particular reason. Based on the number of allusions that were strewn throughout the inscription, the researchers believe that Vamoth perished so he could join the army of the chief Norse god Odin in the Ragnarok, the apocalyptic battle pitting the Viking gods against their enemies. In one section, the researchers have detected a reference to one of the chief giants, the wolf Vernir, swallowing the sun, the act that sets Ragnarok in motion. Another section has Fernir facing off against 20 kings members of Odin's army, and the Grove of Sparks, a name for the Ragnarok battlefield. And near the end of the inscription, the team has found a reference to Odin's son, Vithar, who vanquishes Fernir after the creature kills his father. Only then can the son's daughter take her mother's place in the sky. But there is an interesting mention. It's found in a line that says, quote, who nine generations ago lost their life. Now, given that the runestone dates from around 800 and 11 allowing 30 years per generation. That event would have occurred in the early 6th century in the 500s. The scholars believe that the line describes the death of the sun and refers to a period that began in 536 AD when a series of volcanic eruptions is known to have blocked the sunlight for several years, leading to mass starvation in most of Europe. Reference to events of nearly three centuries earlier, the researchers began checking and and they know that there were solar storms that turned the sky red at this time, and there were also very cold summers. There was a near total eclipse of the sun that would have scared the living daylights out of people. With the threat of a crisis looming, Vamoth is described on the runestone as having been cut down before his time in order to help Odin's army defeat the giants, ensuring that the sun would continue to shine. So it's, it's interesting that this may mark a natural occurrence that that period of in 536 that's believed that the uh, volcanoes are, are from Iceland and you have this haze on the ground like a fog for more than a year and a half and you have the bubonic plague that breaks out in other areas so this is it's almost like they the people were believing that they were in the Ragnarok at the time now this information that I've just given you comes from a, a brand new July 2020 archaeology magazine so I just thought I'd add that in, keep you up to date.
A general map showing the expansion of the Vikings and their raiding really isn't that good of a representation. It's better to see it broken up in the segments. So here, for example, is a map of the expansion or the raiding, if you will, of the Anglo-Saxon Jutes, which had come in, of course, at the end of the Roman Empire. But this would be 5th century to the 7th century, 400s to 600s. And then here we have the next period. There's the Norwegian conquest up to the North Shetlands, Orkneys, Hebrides, Ireland, part of Scotland. You have the Danish conquests. And again, this one now, this one goes from 600 to 800. So now we're getting into the time period at the end of Charlemagne's kingdom. And then here we have Saxon and Viking Britain. Uh, we, of course, have a little picture here showing the Viking raiding. If you want to call it Linden's Farm, you, that's the very first monastery to be invaded by the Vikings in England. There you see the Viking settlements in green and the Saxon settlements and Danish settlements takes up quite a bit of England. Then if we move on to the 10th to the 11th century, which is which is 900 to 1,000. Now there's the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and there's the Danish raiding and there's the Norman region down there, which of course is Viking, which is Norwegian initially. They control part of Brittany and, and they will eventually come north. And so you see Sweden's control, Denmark's control, Norway's control, and the Norwegian territories up there in Iceland, Greenland, and Vinland. And this shows the reach. I mean, they they came into the Byzantine Empire. The story goes that Harold Hadrada and some of his men thought they'd go to Constantinople and raid, and they attacked the city from without. There are just, you know, a few of them. The emperor was impressed by their bravery, brought them in, made them bodyguards, and they will then create a Varangian guard, a Viking bodyguard of the emperor, which is about a thousand men. But we have Kivi and Rus, you have the Scandinavian areas, you have England, so there are pretty much widespread Viking warship, long ships, dragon ships. Dragon comes from the front of the ships where they frequently have a creature of some sort, probably Mythgarthorum or other dragon-like creatures. We have a picture here of a, an artist's rendition of what the ships would have looked like. The normal raiding ship would hold about 30 men. So when you talk about invading a country, you, you need quite a few ships to come in. You can raid with one, two, or three, but if you're going to do colonization or invasion, you need larger ships. They have found some that would indeed hold more than 100 men, but that's very unusual. Now, here is the early finding of one of the Viking ships in one of the harbors, and when it was excavated, removed, and put into the museum, you get the spectacular view of the ship. Now, I want you to notice on this picture, in the back, you see these long poled axes. These are about six feet long, and those are used to pull the ships together or reach over the shield wall to hit people from behind. And you see how low they lie in the, in the water. They can float in three feet of water. Here's a nice view of the side shot of the ship. But a lot of them, they make smaller versions. So here's a smaller example of one that you would find out in the fjords. You certainly wouldn't want to take that out into the North Sea. But usually, this is the type of ship you'd be dealing in, in the fjords. You'd be fishing. You could be trading with that. In that Denver exhibition on the Vikings, they had one of the ships. And you could get close up, take a look at how they put the ship together, held it together. Very, very flexible. And then this was probably the most unique picture of the whole exhibit. They found a ship that had completely rotted, but they had all of its nails or all of its pinions that held it together. So they suspended them from invisible wire so you could see how all of the pieces pinning the ship together would have looked. And then here's an artist's rendition of what one of these small trading skiffs would have looked like. There is a place in Denmark, which is like a Viking village, and you can go and see Viking crafts, and they have reenactors, and you can row a Viking ship that they have, a recreation, a smaller one, and do some other things. It's something that Sherry and I would like to do sometime if we get to Denmark. Viking leader's funeral. Now, you wouldn't do this for anybody but a leader, because if every Viking was sent to his reward in a burning ship. Wouldn't have any trees left in the Scandinavian peninsula. But for the great leaders, a boat would be placed out and you would put the leader on the inside of it and there were all sorts of his treasures and things mixed with it. There's a nice example of this in that Viking movie with Kirk Douglas. One of the interesting things about the filming of that sequence is the University of Denmark made three replica ships with the D 
deal that two of them would then return to them after the movie. When they did the first burning, something was wrong with the filming that it didn't work. They had to burn a second one. But of course, in the Viking miniseries, the funeral of Ragnar and Largatha is very good in the way that it is portrayed. Are some examples of other types of Viking funerals. In this cartoon version, you have a full boat burial, which may also take place for important leaders, showing and fixing all the things in it. And then we see these graves. This is in a, a place in Denmark where you have a cemetery where people were buried, and they made the grave site in the form of a boat using stones. Some people who are not warriors are buried with different objects. So here is an example of a craftsman who was buried inside of his sled. And here's a close-up of the carving of the little trolls on the front of the sled. So there are a variety of methods of commemorating the dead within the Viking community. Viking contributions, trade, exploration, and warfare, and frequently they'll be mixed together. Let's start with the Rus. The word Rus means trader, such as trading individuals. And here we have an example of Vikings trading a woman with other people. They will trade for just about any Anything. They traded children that were captive. They traded objects. They traded materials. You name it, they would trade for it and trade with it. And ultimately, in Russia, it creates. They create the first kingdom, Kievan Rus. It's also known as the Varangian Kingdom as as well. Novgorod, Kiev. Um, they sailed up the rivers and traded with all of those groups. And this is how you would have gotten connections to trade with some of the entities in the Middle East. And perhaps this is the route in which some of that. Damascene steel came up, but they traded everywhere, not just in the Russian territory. The Varangian Guard. Now, I've already talked about the story of Harold Hadrada and how he convinced the, the emperor, the Byzantine emperor, that he needed a, a strong group of bodyguards. And, of course, the Vikings being well over six feet tall, and Harold Hadrada's case, six foot six, you fully armor them, as you see in this picture, with their shield and axes. You know, a couple of hundred to a thousand of those men surrounding the emperor are pretty formidable on the battlefield. And needless to say, is personal protection, they're pretty formidable. If you go to Hagia Sophia and you go to the second floor where the empress has her throne for services and the emperor has his throne for services, you would have had bodyguards up there as well. Many times on horseback along several sections of the church, you find rune carvings, graffiti, if you will. In this case, here's one. This is actually on one of the banisters overlooking the church service from the emperor's point of view. And it translates, Kaftan was here. Some of the them are on the floor and they're a little harder to find without being run over by the tourist groups but they are in this area and are part of the Byzantine Empire until Constantinople collapses in 1453 they probably peak at the time just before the Crusades and then a little bit after the Crusades well, the Vikings become Normans. Normandy is the center of the Vikings in France. Now, this is the result of the raid on Paris and the Ile de la Cité by Rollo and one of his commanders, Rolf Granger, where my family comes from. Now, there's a picture showing the attack on the Ile de la Cité, which was basically all that was there of Paris. It's the seat of the French king after, of course, the Treaty of Verdun and, and everything else. So it has really gotten weaker. And the French king simply bought them off. They said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll give you this land I have in Normandy if you'll become my, my subjects, my vassals. They took them up. So Rollo is the first Duke of Normandy. And eventually he'll convert to Christianity. And if you go to Rouen, to the uh, church, you'll see the material associated with Saint Rollo, if you will. And of course, the Ile de la Cité looks a lot different today than it did in those days. And then this shows Norman territory uh, along Paris, in that particular area there in Normandy. And then you 
you see the Dane law, the Viking territory of England. But ultimately, in our next unit, William the Conqueror will bring the fruits of Normandy to England in 1066 and take over England. And the English king will be both the king of England and the Duke of Normandy. So we're, we're heading then in that direction. But you always have to remember that the Norman knights are originally descended from Viking invaders who created the Dukedom of Normandy. The days of our week. Here's a chart showing the days of the week. There's the English names that we use today. They're the Saxon names. Monday, Mona. Tuesday, Tui. Wednesday, Wooden. Thursday, Thor. Thor's Day, as I like to call it. Friday, Freya. Saturday is left blank. And then Sunday is Sun. You see the title of the god. Well, the Romans, Monday was the moon. Tuesday was Mars. Wednesday, Mercury. Thursday, Jove. Venus is Friday. Saturn is Saturday. And Sunday is the Sun. And then our French terms, lundi, mardi, mercredi, jeudi, verde, samedi, and dimanche. So you can have your choice. If you like to be Roman, Thursday is Jove's day. But as a Viking, I like Thor's day myself. Another contribution of the Vikings is parliaments, the meeting of elders, known as the thing. This is portrayed, and I believe in the first or second show in the uh, series on the Vikings, but it's something that you found everywhere the Vikings had leadership. The leader would call these things to bring his lords in to discuss different matters, and it ultimately then develops eventually into parliaments. You would have had this, you'd have had one in Normandy, obviously when William the Conqueror takes over, his idea of having meetings of the leaders are, are held, and it turns into a parliament. Now, the oldest one in the world is known as the All Thing of Iceland, and that is a picture of the area where it was originally held, and it has there has been a parliament of sorts in Iceland since 930 A.D. The Vikings have always been known as explorers, colonizing Iceland, Greenland, and there's always the discussion of Vinland. So if you look at the chart, you see the island hopping and then the possibility of going down into the North American area for trade. Uh, there is a rune stone in Enid, Oklahoma that the Park Service has put in a building and protected it. But anything other than Lanso Meadows in Newfoundland, it's questionable. They're just being really careful because there have been several people who salted sites in North America. In other words, put actual artifacts on their property and then, quote, discovered them, which have caused some real problems. Now, here is the chart showing the, ex the voyage of Eric the Red, which is 983 to 986, where he goes to southern Greenland. And then you have Leif Erikson's 1000 AD travels. And if you go down into the Canadian map here, you see Lanso Meadows is marked. And to get in closer on that, we see at the very tip of Newfoundland. And the reason this is without a doubt a Viking site is because of the, there's a boat burial and a whole village is there. That's what really sets it off. And that, that is undeniable fact that uh, the Vikings were in North America in 1000 AD. The discussion has always been, why did they stop trading? Why did they leave? And there's always been a, a, an idea that one of the things that happens is Vikings like to trade dairy products particularly cheese. They make spectacular cheese, but Native Americans are notoriously lactose intolerant. So if you're Viking and you trade cheese to the Native Americans and they eat the cheese and it gives them diarrhea or stomach ache, they may assume that you've been poisoned. There may be a variety of reasons for that. There's always been a discussion too about Vinland. Oh, it's it's Vineland. No, that's not what the word means. Vin is meadowland for running cattle and sheep on. So a little different in the way you interpret that. Well, let's look at Lanso Meadows. Here's a map of Vinland again, north, the northern part of Newfoundland. You can see where it's marked there. And then you have the actual archaeological site where the excavation has gone on and where other excavation is in the process. And then here we have a, a map showing the, the whole grounds where the buildings were located, where you have the tidal basin. And then here is the chart showing the, the whole site originally, dwellings, and the replicas. They have 
built a replica site of this. And this is a little aerial view of the replica site. And then we get down on the ground level and they've got a fence around it. They've got the long building. They have reenactors there at certain times of the year. And you can walk through and, and see all of the different parts, little buildings. And it's it's I've not been there, but it, I've known several people who've been and they really enjoy it. So Lanso Meadows is a, is a place to go if you're in northern Newfoundland to see a Viking village as it may have appeared in 1000 AD. If you want to see one older, go to Denmark and see the, the various sites that they have. And then here is one of the big controversies over Vinland. This is an old map. Some people claim that it's modern. Some people claim that it's not, not correct. Some people claim it is authentic. They've carbon dated it, but they use a different kind of ink on this and it get, gets an odd carbon date. But this is supposedly this Vinland map that still brings up a lot of controversy. And then here's my family, part of my family, at the Denver Viking exhibit. Red-haired Sherry, my my, uh, my French-Irish Viking. And then there's uh, little Emma and there's my youngest daughter, Courtney. And they had a nice little place that you could see to take your pictures. So I hope you enjoy the Vikings. Next time we'll be going into the next unit, which is feudalism and the Norman Conquest.